Welcome to Great News for the World. It's hard to imagine any field of human activity today where all the nations can sit down and work together effectively. The problems of race, the problems of different cultures, the problems of different political outlooks, and even the least of all, the areas of religion that are different, makes it just about impossible to achieve anything to really bring about world peace on this earth. But you know, the Bible speaks of a time when all nations of the world will worship one God with one consent. My name is Frank Abel, my guest is Mr. Colin Badger, and together we'd like to tell you about it. First of all, we go to the prophet of Isaiah, chapter 56 and verse 7. And there the Bible states, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Now, not would God's house just be called a house of prayer for all people, but it's going to be a house of prayer for all people. You may recall the words of Jesus when he went into the temple and he drove out those who were selling doves and those who were making merchandise of that, of that house. And he said that they should not do that because this house was to be a house of prayer for all people. Now since Jesus' time has never got any better, never yet has this happened. And so it's something the Bible speaks of in the future. Now this is going to take place in the city of Jerusalem. When we look at the city of Jerusalem today, we don't see a city that is unified in its worship, but looking along its skyline, we see all the different marks of where different peoples and different races and different languages worship different gods. But that skyline is going to greatly change because as God has said in his word, the day is coming when the Mount of Olives right next to Jerusalem is going to cleave in two. And the area around that great cleavage in the earth is going to fall down flat. It seems that there's going to be an area of about 22 miles, which now is rolly and hilly ground, that's going to be flattened. And the area of Jerusalem is going to be greatly elevated. Now you can imagine when there's that kind of activity, in the site or in the site area of Jerusalem that what we see there now has got to be destroyed. Instead, God is going to build a great temple. Now, there's things got to happen first, as we mentioned. Of course, the geography has got to change. But then, the people of Israel have got to come back and accept God and accept His Son, Jesus Christ. That's got to happen. There's got to be a world government being organized so that when the temple is built, all nations can come up to this place. Well, if people had the opportunity, I doubt very much they would today, you see there's got to be something else happen. The nations have got to be conditioned, and that's exactly what God says is going to happen. If you look at Micah, the little prophet, prophecy of Micah in chapter 4, there's a very interesting record here of things that are yet to happen on the earth. Verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Well, that's a time that's going to be greatly different than now, isn't it? The great emphasis on the preparation for war is over. And what all people desire now will be a reality. And people will concentrate on peace and on agriculture. And nations will desire to go up to Jerusalem because there they will worship God and they will want to worship God. 
It's a tremendous time to look forward to when a society will be so greatly changed to want to do these things. Well, Colin, we mentioned there's going to be a house of prayer. Can you tell us a little about this house? Indeed we can, Frank. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthians, For I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. A very wonderful statement concerning certain things in the future that God has prepared for those who are faithful to him. My friend, what you and I are about to consider is one of the most exalted topics in all the Bible. We are going to try to obtain just a glimpse of some of those future things that Paul spoke of. Those things that God has prepared for those who obediently follow our Lord and Master Jesus Christ. Frank has really already identified our topic, the establishment of a house of prayer for the entire world, a task which the scriptures claim will be established by the return of Jesus Christ and his reigning on earth as king. There are many Bible passages that explain the purpose and the construction of this house of worship. We are going to concentrate our attention, however, just on the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 40, to 48. Although we will allude to other passages of scripture, this will be the area that we're going to work on the most. A man called Henry Sully did some research in this regard, trying to understand what the prophet is portraying for us on God's behalf. Now, we're not claiming that his illustrations or his suggestions are faultless. He combined his architectural training and his love for the Bible and trying to portray for us, as best as can be done, what some of these places of worship will actually be like. You may be interested in knowing that Sully's research was combined in a book called The Temple of Ezekiel's Prophecy. We have an illustration for you of the front cover of Sully's book. Let's now turn our attention to some of the details in Ezekiel's prophecy concerning this house of prayer for all nations. In Ezekiel chapter 47 and 48, we are told that the entire land of Israel will be altered and that there will be changes such that the 12 tribes of Israel will receive certain portions of the land for themselves, with the exception of the tribe of Levi that has a special portion in the middle. Now this may surprise you. Jesus, though, made this claim very clear during his ministry. He assured his disciples, Ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, ye also, speaking of his disciples, shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So it's an assertion that Christ made as well. Now in the center of Israel, as it is reestablished in the kingdom age, we will find an area called the Holy Oblation. Now this is described for us in Ezekiel chapter 48 and verse 20. This is now illustrated for you in a picture from Sully's book. In accordance with the details given in Ezekiel's prophecy, the picture shows that his central portion of the land will be called the Holy Oblation. If you look at the picture now, you can see that it is divided into three sections. The top section is an area laid aside for a group of people called the Sons of Zadok. The middle section is a portion for the Levites. And the bottom section is called the possession of the city, as described in Ezekiel chapter 45. Now note in particular, as we look at this central section in the center of the land of Israel, that there is a sanctuary or a temple which is pinpointed in our picture by the top arrow located between the top section and the middle section right on the border there. In the bottom section there's another important detail. In the possession of the city there is a central square marking a city. Now Ezekiel is told that this city would be called in the Hebrew tongue Yahweh Shema, which means, and it's translated this way in the King James Version, the Lord is there. 
And this, my friend, is a key idea that links all that Ezekiel has to say on God's behalf for this vision of this house of worship in the future. It indicates that God is there, that God is with men in a very special way, reigning through Jesus Christ and his faithful followers. We're going to return now to a detail that we noted in the top section, the temple or the sanctuary. It is illustrated now for you in this picture, according to Sully's conceptions. The details are based on Ezekiel chapter 40 to 43. Note now the main features, if you will. Firstly, there is the square outer wall that marks the parameter of the entire structure. This is called the outer court in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 20. It's described as the frame of a city. It's really a kind of central corridor flanked by a series of adjoining chambers or rooms giving a wall-like appearance. We could then pass through the gates into the outer, into the inner court, which is an area facing the entire inner section of the structure. Note that in the center of the inner court is the temple wall, which Sully suggests is circular. It too is really a corridor of chambers or rooms flanking either side of the central pavement, just like the outer court. Finally, in the very center of the inner court or temple area is the altar. We'll come back and talk about that a little later on. The altar, we should note though, is really on an elevated area, almost like a mountain, in the center of the entire structure. Ezekiel is told that streams of water would flow down from the top of the altar down into the area of the inner court below. Now our next picture is a close-up or a half plan of the sanctuary we have just been describing. Let's note the following details. First of all, we see the streams of water that are emitted from the outer wall. Some expositors, by the way, suggest that the entire outer court is about a mile square. If that's true, on the basis of the reed measurements in Ezekiel, it would be an enormous structure. We will now take the perspective of a worshiper in Christ's kingdom. His approach to the temple would be, be, would be by one of the entrance gates, which are spaced around the outer court evenly, as illustrated for you now in this diagram. Let's note again some of the main features. The worshiper will first ascend the seven steps to the entrance gate. As he does so, he will notice a line of pillars that will have the appearance of palm trees as described in the prophecy. Passing now through the gates, our next diagram gives the perspective of one standing in the corridor of the outer court, looking down its length. Note the chambers on either side, or the rooms on either side, as described in Ezekiel chapter 40. Possibly, these chambers or rooms will accommodate many, many people who will come to this temple in the future age to learn of God's ways and to understand all that he desires of them. Note also, at the end of the corridor, the conspicuous edifice, which is really called in Ezekiel chapter 46 and verse 20, the corner court. We're told in that prophecy there that this will be a place used for the preparing of the sacrifices. It will house the kitchens, in other words. Now beyond the outer court is the inner court, which in turn gives access to the central temple and the altar. Our last diagram highlights some of its main features according to Sully's architectural conception. The diagram gives us an exterior view of the walls of the inner temple. Note the palm-like pillars and the alternating configurations of a lion and a man, both described for us in Ezekiel chapter 41, verses 18 to 19. We conclude by just making a very important observation. This entire temple is dedicated to the proclamation of God's presence and obviously, as we look at the various facets described by Ezekiel, it is intended to accommodate people for the purpose of teaching them of God's ways. 
It was interesting, Colin, to go through that. Very, very interesting. And also, I think it's important for us to note that you, you started off by describing how this was in a land that was owned by the Jews, or where the Jews lived. So that when all nations come up to worship at this temple, they're going to have to, of course, know about this, and they're going to have to realize that God has greatly favored the Jews. Now, that's an interesting thing on the basis that a lot of people wonder why God would ever do that. But, of course, that is prophesied, and it might be important for us to go and have a look at more detail concerning what the Jews will really receive. If we look at the map and have a look at the area of Israel today, in terms of the world, it's a very, very small area, just this little area on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. But in the land that Abraham was promised when he was standing on the Dead Sea, all the land northward, southward, eastward, and westward he could see was described as a land from the Nile right across to the Euphrates. And therefore, the land that the people of Israel will occupy in the Kingdom Age, if it goes from the Nile to the Euphrates and has bounded by the northern limits of the Euphrates, is going to be a much bigger area than is presently occupied by the people of Israel. And of course, it, it speaks of a great favoring on God's part of these people. Now that's not at all exceptional when you understand what the prophets have said concerning Israel. For instance, in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, it speaks there of things which undoubtedly have never come to pass yet, and of a time which is so typical of what you've described, Colin, when all nations will come up to worship, then of course all nations will associate with the blessings on the Jew. And that is exactly the way Zechariah chapter 8 verse 23 describes it. We read there, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Well, they've heard that God is with them, obviously. As you mentioned, Colin, if they have to come to the, the people of Israel's land in order to worship God with one consent, they will know that God has favored the Jews. Not favored the Jews unrighteously, but the Jews will themselves have turned back to God. They will have been brought back to their land from all over the earth where they have been scattered. They will be brought back, and as the prophet Ezekiel describes it, the rebels will be purged out. And the ones that were in the land at the time of the great battle of Armageddon, of course, they will have gone through this tremendous crisis in their life so that there will be a few of the Jews in this land, say, compared to the number that are living, there'll be a few who will have been brought through this fire of affliction, and those people will be the ones to whom the other nations of the world will look up to. Well, we see that this is just a little bit of what the Bible says about the Jew. Of course, it's an Israeli book. It was written by Jews, who of course were inspired by God to say something that was going to be truthful for all generations, but they were Jewish characters. When we look in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 60, it describes a lot more detail as to how the nations of the world will favor the Jews. They're not just going to say that. They are really going to favor these people. Look at what it says here. Isaiah chapter 60 at verses 10 to 12. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces, your margin says, wealth of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. A great change, isn't it, in the attitudes of the peoples of the earth towards the Jew. And so they will see that these are a people that are finally what God intended them to be. They are an example to the nations about them. Now, when we look at this character of, of the people of Israel, and we look at the temple worship, and we 
try to understand that you alluded to there of the, of the feast that they will keep. There's an interesting point that a lot of people just cannot comprehend as to why it, we need it. It speaks of sacrifices. You may know that in the Old Testament, the Jewish people offered animal sacrifices in their worship of God. And it speaks of keeping feasts in this temple. Cullen described an altar. Cullen, can you tell us a little more about this? Indeed we can, Frank. In our last consideration of the details pertaining to the temple in this future age, we gave attention to the section called the inner court. We'll just return now to one of our first diagrams and look at an overview of the sanctuary. Let's just note some of the major details pertaining to the sanctuary. And our picture, I think, will highlight some of these points. First, in the outside parameter, we find a reference in Ezekiel to what is called the outer court. It's a wall-like area, and as we've already mentioned, it's described as being like the frame of a city. We then move from the outer court to the next region inside, called, in Ezekiel's prophecy, the inner court. And as Sully has portrayed it, he suggests it is circular. We move then to the area which is in the very center of this structure, the center of the sanctuary, called the altar which seems to be, from Ezekiel's descriptions, on an elevated area, almost like a mountain. Now, previously, we noted in our remarks that water is emitted from the underside of this altar, which then flows down and finds its exit by way of the north and south ends of the outer court. Now, Sully has drawn in for you there the various streams of water flowing out from the outer court. Let's now view a close-up of the altar details that we've been speaking about. See if we can pick up then the major highlights of this important structure. The details are given for us in Ezekiel 43 and verse 16. Let's then look at the altar. We note first of all that there is a large outer court area, almost like a pavement base at the top of the altar. This idea of an outer court is very much in keeping with what we've already seen concerning the inner court and the outer court and the rest of the structure. Then, there seems to be a wall or a buttress forming a perfect square, really establishing the altar proper. This again is quite apparent from Ezekiel's description. Now we notice that it is a perfect square on the basis of the measurements given in Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 16. An important question may now have come to your mind, which Frank mentioned. The presence of this altar must surely imply that there will be sacrifices taking place in this temple age. Can this be true? Will God actually reinstitute sacrifices in Christ's kingdom? And if so, who will offer them? Let's take a look at uh, what Ezekiel says concerning this, and we're going to look at other scriptures as well. We are not restricted then just to Ezekiel's prophecy. In the prophecy of Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, the prophet speaks of something that merges with this description in Ezekiel. Zechariah 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. An altar again is referred to in verse 20. Well, Zechariah confirms what Ezekiel has told us. It's confirmed also by other passages in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, and Malachi. There will be sacrifice. And the passages we've just mentioned in Jeremiah, Isaiah, in Isaiah, or Malachi, indicate that the nations of the world, including the mortal nation of Israel, will go up and worship. Zechariah 14 makes that very clear for us. And what would be the purpose of offering sacrifice when Christ himself is present? Well. We in no wise are trying to deflect from the central principle that Christ is the sacrifice for all. 
that he died once for all for the remission of sins. What we see, though, in the sacrifice at this time in the future age is a pointing back down through the ages to the divine plan that God has shown us. His lessons clearly illustrating that approach to him is on the basis of sacrifice, meaning complete dedication of the whole being to God. In the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices did not really obtain forgiveness of sins. One needed faith. They pointed forward to Christ, but in the millennial age, the sacrifices will point backwards in retrospect, showing this divine, wonderful theme of sacrifice as the approach to the Almighty God. That surely is the central principle of the altar. We're told also that from this altar, water will be emitted down through the area and then out through the outer court. Ezekiel was told to wade in this water, and we are told that Ezekiel is a man of sign. Could it be implied here that approach to God through the gates of entrance will be by passing through water, symbolizing a cleansing or a baptism? It could very well be, because as Zechariah tells us, that this water coming from the temple or from Jerusalem will be living water. Well, there you have it. And so can you imagine the inauguration of this great temple when people from all over the world come up to worship at this building? It will truly be a great time. And it's summarized for us by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14, verse 9, when he says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. A tremendous concept to ponder. And as you can see, the clouds in that area, it's just like it was back in the time of Moses, God showing his acceptance of the proper worship. It's going to be a fantastic sight to see this, as Colin outlined it, a mile square temple, elevated away up in the air so that people would have to trek up to this, and would have to bring their offerings, of course, for this sacrifice principle that he spoke of, to take place. This is reserved for people who will be mortal in the kingdom. We hope, and I hope that you hope, that in the kingdom age you will be immortal, that you will then have been accepted by Jesus Christ, and that you will therefore be replacing the work of the angels that they do now. It's going to be a great time. It's worth pondering far more than we had time to deal with in our brief half hour. Look at Ezekiel from chapter 40, as we've said, to chapter 48, and you'll see a lot more of the things that are described concerning that time period. Read God's Word. You'll be greatly rich and rich if you do. And may God bless your study of His Word.